be the same I sense an awesome moving of the Holy Spirit I see his countenance resting on your I tell you, I love to hear Sister Jonda sing, don't you? And she's such a blessing. And, of course, you know what she has to put up with at home. And I <laughs> All I can say to you is I think a lesser woman would have probably cracked by now. Amen? <laughs> but uh, thank you, Jonda. That was beautiful to remind us that he's here, right? And you know that. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, you'd like to turn to the reading. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter uh, 16. If you turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, we'll begin reading at verse 13, and I'll read all the way down through verse 18. So in honor of the reading of God's holy and air and inspired living word, would you please stand with me this morning for the reading? The Bible says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, 
And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's bow for a moment of prayer as we ask God's blessing now upon the reading here of his word. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning as it talks about your church. And Lord, it's the world's greatest institution. And I want to speak to your people about that today. And I pray, God, that you'll not allow untruth to pass through my lips, that I'll speak the truth of the word of God and find lodging in hearts. I pray for that sinner that's nearest eternity. I pray that you save them for Jesus' sake. I pray for that poor Christian that's backslidden. I pray that they be reclaimed for the gospel's sake. We pray especially in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you might be seated. Well, I want to speak to you about the world's greatest institution. A lot of great institutions in the world. I think you know this. The, there's great institutions of commerce. I know that you've, um, some of you may work at Marathon Oil. That's a great, Marathon is a great institution of, of commerce. There's great institutions of healing. Uh, my wife and my mother and, and others in my family work for King's Daughters Medical Center, and it's a great institution of medical healing, and they do a great job. There's institutions of education. I know we have the principal here at Boyd County High School, and Boyd County High School is a great institution of learning, and we have uh, other great schools in the state of higher education, University of Kentucky, and others, other regional universities like uh, Moorhead and, and EKU and so forth. And so we have all of those, but none of them can match uh, the, insti- the uh, church with Jesus Institute. I'm saying that the church is the greatest of all of them. It's greater in glory because it's a glorious church, right? God's church is. It outshines them in beauty. The Lord said it, there's not going to be spot or wrinkle on his church. It outshines them in usefulness. I'm so grateful for our churches, especially when we had all of those hurricanes and how our churches responded through disaster relief. And uh, we had other institutions like Samaritan's Purse and so forth, which would just uh, come alongside churches. But uh, they exist because of churches. And so we, the church that the Lord instituted outshines all of them, outshines them in influence. And I know the church is divine. You say, well, preacher, how do you know it's divine? Because just look at the roles. So many of church members never attend. So many church members never contribute to the work of the church. I think about the Green Baptist Association, which you're a part of. I counted them up. There were 16, over 16,000 uh, Baptists in the Green Baptist Association. You know how many of them went to Bible study this morning? Probably somewhere around 3,500. So that means we're giving, getting about 78, we're not getting 78% of our church membership even out for small group Bible study. They don't show up on a weekly basis. You say, well, what about worship? Well, it's not, any, not much better. In Southern Baptist Life, we claim to have 16 million members. And out of 16 million members, we have about 6,000 that show up on a given Sunday. And so that's about 62.5%. So 62.5% of our membership showing up on a weekly basis. And despite the treatment that the church receives by its members, the church lives on. And I think about the great things that have come out of our churches. I think about some of the prominent schools in the state of Kentucky that's come out of our churches, like the University of Cumberland's, uh, Ashbury uh, College, Georgetown College, Campbellsville. I live in Pikeville. Uh, University of Pikeville was a Presbyterian school, along with others that we could mention, many others. I know I'm leaving out a whole list, but for sake of time, I'll just be brief. But prominent schools in the United States, a lot of the Ivy League schools came out of churches, and uh, as a result of the churches, they, uh, they exist. And, but you wouldn't know that today, of course, and uh, they've drifted far, far away from that. As a matter of fact, in the early days, we used the Bible as a textbook. Now, you couldn't do that today, but in the early days, they did. Fisher Ames, the founder and politician that helped formulate the Bill of Rights, 1758 through 1800, he lived between 1758 and 1808. He stated this, he said, the Bible should be the principal textbook of the schools. We should use the Word of God. Now, you try that today. I know Brother Tommy would like to do that, but he wouldn't dare try that today. He would have a visit from the ACLU. I'm sure that he would very quickly. 
And, uh, and so we don't use the Bible as a textbook um, anymore. But anyway, uh, many of our homes for children came out of our churches. For us, you know what it is? It's, it's sunrise, homes for children. And what do we do at sunrise? We take care of orphans. You read anything in the Bible about taking care of orphans? We take care of over 1,000, it's about 1,100 some odd orphans now that we're take, taking care of, as many as we can. And we're trying to take on more, and it's, and it's hard, but nevertheless, we're doing all that we can. And the Bible says that pure religion undefiled is to take care of orphans and look out after the widows. And so we do that in our churches. I think about, um, they talk about making America great again and, and uh, providing jobs and so forth. Well, let me just give you an idea of what happens in our, uh, as a result of our churches. We have 3,600 IMB missionaries plus their families that are supported by churches. We have 4,500 North American Mission Board uh, missionaries that are supported by uh, churches and their families. We have six seminaries, fully staffed seminaries with, with professors and teachers and, uh, uh, you know, uh, cafeteria workers and groundskeepers and all the things that go with that and uh, that's supported by churches. We have 47,272 churches employing pastors and staff. Many of them have really good salaries and good benefits, and all of this is a result of the influence of the church. And so I'm saying that the church that Jesus instituted is the, is the world's greatest institution. So I want to speak to you about the church today. Uh, you're getting ready to call a pastor, and you need to know something about the church you're getting ready to call him to. First of all, there's the meaning of the church, okay? The meaning of the church, the church, when we think about the church, we think of the church in two different ways. Number one, we think of the church in a universal sense. That is the invisible church. And that's the church. Uh, and then we also think about church in a local sense, and that's the church to which you belong. Now, the universal church represents all the redeemed from the time of the rapture all the way uh, or excuse me, from the time of Pentecost all the way to the rapture. And it's referred to oftentimes in the Bible as the bride of what? The bride of Christ. Now, you don't have to worry about that church. You say, why do I have to worry about that church? Because it's the bride of who? Christ. And guess what Jesus does? He takes care of his bride. So you don't have to worry about uh, the invisible church, but you have a responsibility to the local church. That's your responsibility. That's the one you ought to be concerned about. And so when it comes to the local church, uh, that's the one to whom you belong. And so, uh, so the work of this church then belongs to who? It belongs to you. You're a group of baptized believers, and you've been gathered here at this address to do what Jesus would do if he lived here. This is what your responsibility would be. And so... Um, we tend to think in terms of a building when we think in terms of a church, but the Bible doesn't talk about a building. The Bible talks about a what? About a body. And so the church is not a building. The church is a body. And the Bible says that it has many parts, one body, but has many parts. And the same way says uh, we're one body in Christ, individual members one of another, and so, and so on. And I think you know those Scripture verses. And so when I think about the illustration that Paul gives and compares the church to a body is just kind of like at my hand. If my hand were severed and I no longer had this hand, I would be crippled by that much. If I didn't, if I lost one of my feet as part of my body, then I would be crippled even more. I'd be crippled by that much and so forth and so on. I think you get the illustration. But when you're a member of the church and you fail to serve through the local church, the church is crippled by that much. Just think about the, uh, about the numbers of members that we don't have serving the local church and think about what it could be if they did serve. Wouldn't it be something if just members just showed up on a given Sunday throughout the whole Greenup Association? Wouldn't that be something? We had 16,000 people show up to Baptist churches on a Sunday morning in Greenup Baptist Association. I tell you, uh, people would think that the rapture was getting ready to take place, Right? And uh, it'd really be something. But remember, God takes care of the universal church, but guess who's supposed to take care of the local church? You are. 
You're responsible for the care. God's entrusted that to you. And so we think about the meaning of the church. But then also we think about the message of the church. And first of all, when we think about the message of the church, it's not the Ten Commandments. It's not the golden rule. It's not being good to your neighbor. Don't misunderstand me. All of those things are good, and we ought to do those things as much, much as humanly possible. Uh, Christ living in us, empowering us to be able to do those kinds of things. Absolutely. But that's not the message of the church. You know what the message of the church is? It's the what? It's the gospel. I say the world needs a pill. It's the gospel. And, um, and we need that. And we, need, it's, it, we could refer to it as the good news. What's the good news? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, it's how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and He's raised again the third day, also according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. So I want you to say that with me, could you? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and raised again the third day, also according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. It's the, it's the uh, life, death, and burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. And that's the good news. And so we're, that's our message. We're to preach the gospel. We're to preach uh, repentance of sin and faith in Christ Jesus. Repentance means that I change the way I act, change the way I think. I'm willing to turn from something, turn to someone. The something I'm willing to turn from is my sin and myself. And the someone that I'm t to turn to is the Lord Jesus. And when I turn and put my, place my faith and trust in Him, I experience the new birth. Jesus said, I didn't say this. Jesus said, he said, you must be born again. Born once, you need to be born twice. If you're not born twice, you'll, you'll die twice, right? And uh, there's a second death that the Bible talks about in the book of the Revelation. You don't want that. But nevertheless, the Bible says this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, listen to it. Without Christ, without God, without hope. Without Christ, without God, without hope. It's just a summary of that, of that passage of Scripture. Now listen, that means if you would die without Christ, you're without God and you're without hope. You'd be separated from all that's good throughout all of eternity in a place that the Bible refers to as hell. So we have the message of the church. It's the gospel. Jesus died, Jesus buried, and Jesus raised. But then there's not only the meaning of the church, there's the message of the church, but then there's the mission of the church. And uh, uh, it's not mud out work, it's not chainsaw work, it's not handing out bottles of water or, or delivering meals on wheels. Although we participate in all those kinds of things, and we ought to participate in those kinds of things, I, I really believe in those types of things. But the mission of the church is to make disciples. How many of you knew that? 